Hi, everyone. Welcome to my first interview of 2022. And I'm really excited about this one. Today, I am joined by Libby Rothschild, who is the founder and CEO of Dietitian Boss. She's also a sales and marketing expert and a business coach. So I feel like we're going to have a really in-depth conversation today. Uh, so Libby, thank you so much for being here and sharing your time with me. Oh, I'm thrilled. Thank you for having me and uh, really looking forward to, to connecting and, and having a conversation about all things sales, marketing, and mindset. Beautiful. Uh, the way that I like to start all of my podcast interviews is to ask you who your current role model is at the moment or who you are looking up to right now. Yeah, I, there's so many amazing people that I, I could pick from, but I, I would say Sarah Blakely stands out the most. Um, also, because recently you might have seen in the media that she gave her employees, I believe it was like $10,000 tickets. Um, don't quote me, I can't remember the exact dollar amount um, when she had sold her company. And so her treating her employees so well and surprising them with that compensation is great role modeling for business owners to see that um, there's many levels to entrepreneurship. And at her level, um, it's great to role model how to give back and how to empower your staff and your team and to build a team and to be able to help develop them um, is really, really amazing and inspirational. So that, that stood out to me as a really, really fantastic, beautiful way to role model. So I'll, I'll never forget that story when I saw it. And, and I thought, wow, like if I could just, it's so aspirational for me to try to, I always try to develop my team and, and she really set the bar pretty high. <laughs> yes, definitely. And it's not the first time she's been mentioned on this podcast as a role model, like just such a game changer in the industry. And, you know, just kind of touching on what you were saying, I think a lot of the time when we think about being business owners or entrepreneurs, we kind of only go to the point of like, well, you know, when I can earn X amount and, you know, I can have this many days off and we only think as far as ourselves, but if we can kind of project a little bit further into the future and how can we give back or, or build a community, it really takes the business to the next level. Absolutely. And I do feel like that's a lot of that comes when you hit small milestones, you mm -hmm. then can re retool your brain to think more and more as you get more into affirmations and visualization. Uh, I, I do see uh, that uh, people are able to grow their dreams and vision, but it is true that a lot mm -hmm. of us will, will kind of stay small and think small uh, because it just feels so far out of reach to be able to create a six figure business or a seven figure business, or be able to, to create the life we want. But we, we really do have that ability. It, it all comes from thinking it, visualizing it and believing it and making it happen. And that's why the more people, especially women I, I see doing that, um, it's just so rewarding that they're able to role model what's possible and, and really share that to, to us business owners at different levels that, that, they, that we can do it too. Whether we're working a full-time job or whether we're, we are in our business full times and we still want to take it to the next level, it's definitely possible. Mm. And it's also proof, isn't it? It's like, here's this amazing woman absolutely killing it. She's not only making, you know, really good money, changing the world, she's giving back. And it's like proof that if someone else can do it, you can do it too. And that's what I love about the internet is we get so many opportunities to see so many different versions of success that it's like, how, is, how could this not be possible for me? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's why I love um, really supporting other business owners. I think it's important um, creating that community, giving back, empowering other people, just taking a moment to engage and support them and even ask them, other your, your peers, how can I help you? How can I support you? Because um, the more that we can help each other achieve our unique goals, um, the, the more enjoyable the process is. And you can develop on your people skills, which also translates to sales. Um, so I'm a big fan of growing together and supporting one another. Um, it, it can be really lonely, especially, you know, for those of us that are online in business, right? We're at our homes. Some of us are, have, you know, uh, still some, some strict policies and limitations uh, with everything going on in the world right now. And being able to hop online and connect and empower people is a universe mm -hmm. that's there waiting for us uh, to tap into. And I still see so many people that have an opportunity, business owners to take advantage of that and really uh, create and grow in communities and, and support their peers. And, and I see that as an, uh, an opportunity for us to, to grow our mindset so that we can start thinking bigger um, by really engaging in communities and engaging with our audience and our, our potential clients um, online and supporting them. Mm. Oh, I'm excited to chat with you today. That's already like a really, you know, big truth bomb. Um, but before we get into it, 
I would love to know a little bit more about you and yourself sure. and what in particular you do and perhaps, you know, what an average day looks like for you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, an average day. Okay, let me start about a little bit about me. Mm -hmm. I am a, a, a actually a clinical dietitian. I'm a registered dietitian and I have a, a master's degree in clinical nutrition and undergrad in nutrition. My life is very nutrition, right? And uh, so I founded my company, Dietitian Boss, uh, which is a proprietary process, a trademark system to help registered dietitians. Um, and, and let me, I'll explain what I do, but I'll, I first want to share how it started briefly. Um, I was in my clinical office. Uh, registered dietitians are, are very uh, low paid. We're required to have our master's degree, like most healthcare professionals, right? Social workers as well are, are not really paid super well. Um, so I was making, uh, here in New York city, $55,000 a year, uh, with a master's degree working as a clinical dietitian. So I couldn't afford my rent because that was really low pay. And I was, I was forgotten in the hospital. Like I, <laughs> they didn't see me, they didn't hear me. So my self-worth was pretty low. I was losing my confidence, um, because I, I went to school so excited about nutrition and, and people weren't really interested mm -hmm. and I didn't feel like validated with my work. And being a, an ambitious extrovert, I wanted to tell everybody about nutrition, but I was feeling, uh, for, I was feeling broke and I was feeling like I wasn't visible and I didn't matter. And it would put me into a pretty, pretty serious, bad position. Uh, firstly, what I did is I ended up working additional jobs and revenue streams. I ended up creating a curriculum and teaching that. And even though I was able to make extra money, I was obviously working so many extra hours. I still, I was making a little more. Uh, but I still wasn't feeling super aligned and I knew there was more opportunities that I could find, right? Because uh, true entrepreneurs find opportunities in any situation. That's one of the definitions of an entrepreneur. You have to be able to find a, a way to, an opportunity to, to make things work. Um, so I shared my story on social media one day and, and I was uh, sharing with a friend actually that I didn't know any other dietitians and I felt so alone and I wanted to know how they were making money or was there other people like me? Um, and my friend said, you know, go find them online. And so I listened to her. I, I went on Instagram. I created a business feed. It must've been four years ago because my business turns four next in, in March. I went online and I just started talking about my life. I documented my life and shared who I was, what I did. I was in my clinical office. I, I have videos and pictures I still share from four years ago. And I shared about what I was teaching. I shared about working overtime. I should just, just talked about what I was doing. And I ended up amassing a uh, following about 10,000 dietitians within the first year on Instagram. And I also uh, immediately had dietitians reaching out to me, asking if I could coach them. They said, can you help me make money? And then they said, can you help me make money using social? Cause they saw that I would leveraged and tapped into social to connect with people. And they wanted to know how they could do that for their respective businesses as well. So I ended up uh, creating a course and then I ended up creating a mini mastermind and then I ended up creating a group program and then the business grew and grew. Uh, and uh, now I have a, a program and a staff of uh, seven people and we hit the million dollar mark in 2020, which was really exciting. Um, and it all stemmed from me being a clinical dietitian who was broke and felt like a lack of value and uh, working my nine to five. I created this business while working my nine to five um, to, because I wanted you know, to do more and I wanted to, to really connect and spread spread the good word. Um, so my, my business is a mission-based business to help create more uh, dietitians in private practice. Because after I did the research, I realized only 8% of dietitians own a business, which makes sense because we're largely told to go into clinical jobs where we're underpaid and then we're, we're often dissatisfied. And there's some incongruence with what you know consumers and, and people need for health outcomes, but then what's available in, in the private space. So I wanted to fill that gap with, with my company. Mm. Oh, wow. I mean, number one, that's such an awesome story. Number two, congratulations for hitting the million dollar mark. Uh, so two years ago, that's incredible. <laughs> um, that's okay. Before I pick your brain on where you're at right now, I want to touch on something that I actually haven't spoken about a lot on the podcast, but I think it might blend well with where our conversation's going today is like a lot of people don't talk about the stress that low incomes can put on you and just like your overall well-being as a person you know obviously I kind of had the same journey as you I was in a situation where I was really poor like could barely you know pay rent each week like it was just week to week barely getting by it was super stressful and not only does it you know put a toll on your work 
on yourself. It puts a toll on your vision for the future. You really struggle to see how you can get out of this and, and how you could even think big picture when you're living so week to week. And I think, you know, a lot of these jobs and salaries, they seem good at the time. You think, oh, 55K, like, yeah, perfect. Like, you know, I, I'm in. And then when the reality hits and you get, you can barely pay your rent or you can barely get by, it's like, it just saps all purpose and it just, it just drains your energy, doesn't it? And it's just, it's so deflating um, to be where you thought you wanted to be and life isn't really working out the way that you'd planned. Yeah. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, it, it is very defeating and deflating. And also, uh, I, as a, uh, a newer dietitian, and this is common in my industry and I'm sure it's common in other industries. I felt I had to pay my dues mm. and I had to get that experience in that position. And, uh, so it was like this guilt, yeah. right. And this lack of confidence that I needed to pay my dues and I needed to do it when in fact I didn't. Um, but yeah, it really did take a toll mm -hmm. and, and it's, it can be really challenging if you identify with that in any, any capacity, maybe you're, you're not a low earner, but you're in a position that you don't love. Like there's, there's definitely this, this frustration, especially with a mindset to create something new while you're in a position that you don't love. And I think that takes a lot of reflection and it takes a lot of courage to be able to take a step forward and that hey, small steps count. So, uh, you know, I didn't grow this, uh, overnight. It took work. I would you know, take pockets of time during my day and, and reach out to people, do my market research, talk to them, find out what their problems were. I built it on the side. And I do think it's manageable for people to, to build side businesses. It's just checking in with your, your mindset and, and looking at um, finding some positivity and even looking at it as an outlet, if you're really feeling down. Hmm. And the interesting thing as well is that you didn't necessarily know where it was going to lead you. You just thought, I just want to do more. I'm going to do this thing on the side. I'm just going to document. I'm just going to, you know, come from a place of, of genuine love for what you do, like, like wanting to share nutrition and wanting to share your journey. And the opportunities arose because you put yourself in that position. It wasn't like you probably knew back then that, you know, I'm going to have this million dollar business. It was more like, I'm just going to start putting things in motion. And it's almost like that trust that the opportunities will present themselves. And they normally do when we, when we put ourselves out of that comfort zone. Yeah. I, I will say to go back to what we spoke about earlier in, in today's episode, uh, we were talking, or maybe I was sharing that, you know, once you achieve something, you can then make the dream bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, I never would have imagined that I would have created a million dollar business and had staff that lives around the world. I never would have dreamed of that. Uh, and it really all started with small steps, success, and then working on my mindset. And, you know, it, I think there's a saying, learn as you go or, or um, uh, just in time learning. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. And, and I really did focus on that. I learned what I needed to at the time and that I needed to. Um, and I really was able to focus. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's important to look within your own unique story, um, on your journey and compare yourself to your own self. Uh, but I would have never imagined in a million years that it grew to what it did. So it's, it's been really fun and mostly because it's a mission-based company. Of course, I care about the money. I'm a business at the end of the day. And, and that matters profit margins and revenues and creating goals around that and growth. And ultimately I love what I do mm. and I love being able to change the lives of uh, dietitians are predominantly women, 80% women in the industry um, and being able to create financially independent women and humans and families and be able to, being able to disrupt an industry is extremely gratifying to me. That matters a lot. And that is initially ultimately why I started this mm. and the money was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Let's see how we can grow this, but we are a mission-based company. Mm beautiful I love that and I always encourage that too you know mission first and you know you worry about you know your money and stuff later because you know it's when it's something that you are so driven by and the mission's so strong you'll always find a way and and you're not like rigid either with it you know the business has to look like this or I have to operate that way or I have to have this role you know it's more what does the business need or what do my clients need or what do I need to do in order to continue to move closer to that mission? And I just think that's a really beautiful perspective sometimes when we're, you know, thinking about the long-term vision of our business. It's rather than like, how many sales have I got to make in the next four weeks? And, you know, how much marketing am I going to do? It's more like, well, what does the, what does the world need from me right now if I just stay true to that mission? 
Yeah. And that's, that's a uh, beautifully framed the way you said that. And the, and the way you mentioned that uh, it doesn't have to be a certain role. Uh, it's what the business needs. And I think that's a lesson that many people don't understand. So I uh, might need to give some examples on that. I think that was really profound and very true. Like at the end of the day or every day, like what does the business need and what do we need to do for inputs to help the business achieve that? Not what, do, you know, not the other way around I really think putting the business and the strategy forward and first is great. That's what we do. Yeah. Always every day. <laughs> Um, did you always have this entrepreneurial side to you or what kind of made you go into the nutrition field? And do you think because of your circumstances, that entrepreneurial side was kind of like sparked within you? Yeah. Uh, so I think that I, I struggled a lot with confidence, like most women. And I, uh, also in school, it was never really supported or encouraged. I have a very direct, uh, even you could call it an aggressive personality. And I don't think that that was ever, um, I don't think that was ever celebrated. Right. I don't think growing up people said, you're going to make an amazing business woman. Nobody ever said that to me. Um, in fact, growing up, people said the opposite. They said, why can't you just slow down? Why do you need to you know, do so many things? Cause I have, I am an overachiever and I grew up like that. And I've always, I had jobs. Um, I had a job. I was a personal trainer when I was 19, I worked in high school. So I don't know if I would say I had entrepreneurial, I didn't like, you know, sell sneakers or flip sneakers or anything like that in high school, I did have a job, but I had some business. You could see that I had some business acumen. In, in high school. And I, I started my first job as a personal trainer that I did for nine years all throughout college. And I did work also as an independent trainer, which means I would go to gyms and pay a copay. Um, I did also work for some gyms, meaning that I was, an, I was employed, but I, I was also independent as a contractor, which meant you, you need some business skills to be able to do that and to sustain clientele. Um, so it definitely helped me with people skills, sales and marketing, which are my skill sets, which translated well but nobody ever really celebrated that. Um, I think that it was something that uh, I saw, I had it in, in me and then I was able to, once the opportunities present themselves, um, I was able to make it work. Um, and, I, and I don't know if that's, uh, that could be multiple reasons as to why, but mm -hmm. I, I would say I've always had some business sense, but I wasn't a business major, right? My, my, all of my background is, is definitely healthcare through and through. Um, and I became a dietitian because uh, actually in high school, I worked at a bank and I did pretty well for commission, which makes sense, right? Because I've got that sales background and I thought about getting a business degree. And I thought to myself, because most uh, healthcare practitioners are heart centered or healers, we care so much about the clients that we serve. I mean, we're bleeding heart centered. Like we care so almost too much sometimes, right? We get so involved. Um, and, and I was more attracted in thinking, oh, I could really make money. I have these skills. I saw that. And I said to myself, you know what? I don't know if that feels good. I want to do something that feels really aligned because I am an empathetic. I am a feelings-based person, like on all my personality tests, Myers-Briggs, et cetera. And when I went into college, I explored some different ideas and I landed on actually nutrition and exercise. And at the time, my, my college didn't have an exercise track. So I did nutrition and I loved it. And this was, this was a while ago. Uh, and, and it wasn't nutrition's gotten a lot more popular since then. We have over 10% growth, which is more than the average profession every year in the field of dietetics, meaning nutritional science. So it is a rapidly growing profession, but at the time, maybe let's say seven, 10 years ago or so, it wasn't the case. I went into it because I thought it was fun. And I thought it was an opportunity for me to feel good about helping people and feel aligned. And at the time I was a personal trainer and I thought, great, I can combine that. And it won't even feel like I work because I love what I do and how fun is that so that was really my my sense um but i did uh i i did didn't realize how low paying it was and i didn't understand how many skills i would need to learn after going through all that schooling when it comes to setting up a business so there, there was a lot of gaps kind of mm -hmm. like what you mentioned about you take a low paying job and then you get the paycheck and you're like wait a minute what and that, that's kind of what i experienced as as well very much what you said i resonate with i got my paycheck when i got my clinical job and said like wait where am I? How did I get here? Right. So that was, that was very, um, very much how, how my story went. Um, so that, that's how I became a dietitian. And, and I would say that, um, I doubted myself a lot when it came to anything entrepreneurial. Cause I didn't think that, uh, I could, I didn't think big enough. I didn't think it was possible. And, and I wasn't really celebrated for my efforts until 
later in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting when you say it though, like you talk me through that journey, it's always like, it's just the little pieces of the puzzle that you gain along the way. You know, you gain a little bit of sales and marketing experience over here. You gain a little bit of business experience over here. You gain some money experience. You know, it's just like, sometimes it feels like we're not on the right path or, you know, we want to do something more, but we're not sure what it looks like. We're stuck in a job that we're not hundred percent sure on, or we love it, but we're not paid enough. And it's like, why is this happening to me? How can I get out of this? And it's, you know, it's always easy to look back and see how it all connected, but there normally is these little like skill sets that you can pick up as you go along and you can always bring them together to use them in, in your business, no matter what that looks like. There's so many facets to being a business owner. Um, you'd be surprised how many little skill sets you're picking up along the way. Yeah. And I think that that all does go into growth mindset as well, because at the time it can feel like a hodgepodge, right. Or you can, I can, I can see where people feel upset or frustrated about switching jobs or switching majors and things like that, or, or careers or even business ideas. Um, but I would say that like you mentioned with the story, um, all of our efforts, all of your efforts all contribute towards your growth and, and do end up helping you in the long term. Like I mentioned, when I was a personal trainer since I was 19, I developed a lot of people skills. And that translated really well when I started leveraging social media marketing mm-hmm. because I had that foundation. And it didn't, it wasn't, you know, I didn't understand how much that would help me at the time, but I did pick up those skills. And so my efforts were fruitful. Um, even though I was, there were moments of frustration, right? <laughs> it was just kind of that. It's just really reframing and, and being grateful. Mm, beautiful. I think that leads nicely onto my next question, which is we're actually in a time at the moment where, you know, a lot of people around the world, no matter where we're kind of sitting or tuning into this episode, a lot of people are reconsidering, you know, their jobs, what they're doing at the moment. Um, you know, we see a lot of stuff in the news at the moment about the great resignation. Everyone's, you know, just considering different lives and lifestyles for themselves. And I guess as someone who kind of was in, you know, more of an employed field working in that healthcare profession, you know, a lot of people want to move away from that corporate life and have a little bit more freedom, a little bit more flexibility. Um, In your opinion, though, what do you think holds a lot of people, maybe especially, you know, the dietitians that you work with back from from taking that first step and, and moving out of the corporate space? Excellent question. I have a couple of theories. Uh, <laughs> the first theory I have is conditioning, mm. um, which is that we are conditioned or we're not usually taught, at least not in, in my profession, to be an entrepreneur. Uh, we are taught to go in and get that nine to five job and get that experience. Not that we need to you know, retire and, and, and die an employee, mm. but that we have to get that experience. And what happens is when we go into those jobs, we start to get comfortable and then we start to doubt that we have to learn new skills. And, and there, there's a, a lot of um, bumps along the way. Um, and I feel that we are, especially in, in um, nutritional science and in, in the dietetics profession, uh, we're very much told we have to get two years of clinical experience. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I think that it, it makes a lot of dietitians feel disgruntled. Um, in general, I would say that, uh, that, that's, that we're conditioned to feel that way um, and that, that we aren't taught entrepreneurial skills unless if we go to you know, business school. Um, so it can't, it's not always supported. Um, and then the other aspect of that would be it's a different mindset and not everybody is, is really cut out to be an entrepreneur, right? Being an entrepreneur means that you see, uh, you find solutions to problems and that you see opportunities even in the most difficult times. And if you have shown any track record of that, or even that thought, those ideas excite you, uh, you might be more, you know, inclined to be an entrepreneur or, or to work or test um, any, any kind of iteration of being an entrepreneur, even if that means you're building something small on the side. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a mindset, it's a skill set, which I think anyone can learn it, but you do have to kind of have that desire and, and be up for the challenge. And then it's that conditioning. So I think those two things are, are really what I see at the forefront of the, of the delay and the, and the pushback for, for going to the entrepreneurial side. Mm. And then to flip it onto your side, like we spoke um, about before you obviously grew your business to, you know, seven figures, I think within your first three years, um, you know, you kind of overcame those setbacks and, and built that all by yourself. What do you think um, the secret to your success is? Yeah. Uh, well, the secret to, to my success is uh, great marketing. 
Uh, so brand differentiation is absolutely our strength. So we uh, don't have direct competitors. I am the only company that helps registered dietitians with a proprietary process based on leveraging social media to start and grow their private practice all the way from launching to creating million dollar businesses. We have clients that have created seven figure businesses from, from the framework. Um, so there's a lot of people that help like healthcare professionals. There's a lot of people, we do have, you know, people that help dietitians, but not specifically with social media marketing and not a proprietary system like the dietitian boss method. So knowing, and I've, I've been differentiated since I started, there were no dietitian business coaching and there wasn't anybody doing what I do in the social media space when I started. So because I'm so unique and I'm so differentiated in my brand, it really helps me stand out. And because I've been able to get so many great client results, um, I've created a community or a universe, as you call it, uh, with our marketing efforts and the success we've had with our clients that's helped me create a system to then help more clients to then support the mission of the company, which is to disrupt the field and create more private practice operators. Um, so I think it's all rooted in, in um, differentiation, which is what I teach. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to stand out. And you'll always have to think what makes me different from my competitor, um, what it gives me that unique um, edge. And that's something that we've mastered. Mm. Yes. The power of a good niche, the power of being the expert in your field, the power of being the thought leader, you know, when someone thinks, you know, I would need support in being a dietitian, it's like, boom, like straight to you. And that can be you know, when you can position yourself in the market like that, it's not necessarily about trying to, you know, scream it from the rooftops, like, look at me, pick me, pick me out of the masses. It's like, you're leading the way. There's no one else. You are the niche. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would say, so that's true. And uh, yes, niche, uh, but you can differentiate without being so niche down as well, uh, as long as you find some way to stand out in your space. So you don't have to, like, we're a hyper niched company. You don't have to be as hyper niched as long as you can explain why you're different and how you're unique. So it's, a, it's an important, it's fundamentals of, of marketing. Um, but there are different, a lot, so many different examples of how, how niche you want to go, but yes, that mm -hmm. is true. That's what's helped us. And it's been really fun being a part of that. And it's also been very innovative, right? Um, so a, a lot of it's leading the way. A lot of it is, is new and it's, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That was actually going to lead on nicely to what I was going to say to you next was, you know, what does someone do if they're not necessarily the only person in that field and they feel like, oh, like I, you know, I've, I've got to compete against these other competitors. Are there, you know, a few different ways that we can start to think about how we can stand out amongst the noise? Yeah. Uh, well, that, that is probably the, the top question I get on a daily basis. <laughs> and it's an excellent question right? Because as we are looking to uh, be profitable, get more clientele and uh, create a sustainable business, you must find a way to answer this question. Um, so you, as I mentioned before, you don't have to be hyper niche like me. That's not necessarily the case, although it has worked for us. It's worked for a lot of our clients. Um, I think what's important is finding is really defining. You have to define your business. And so in defining your business, that means what problem are you solving? What pain points are you addressing in your, uh, in your business and in your marketing? Um, how are you supporting what the client needs? Not what you need, not what you think they need, but what do they need? How are you validating that? A lot of people resist market research. It's just the act of discussing and talking to people within your market and identifying what they want and need. And I teach Mark that you need to do market research on a, a regular basis, like at least an hour a week. My philosophy is that until your business is, uh, let's say, uh, underground, right? Your, your business is dead. If that's the case, that is the only time you would stop doing market research. So every <laughs> business needs to talk to their audience. And if it's not you, the business owner, it's someone in your company. Audience, meaning your current clients, you need to be finding out, are they happy? Are they satisfied? You're asking them qualitative and quantitatively, how can you improve your service? What can you do better? And you're also asking people who are in your market, your demographic, even if they don't turn into clients, what do they want and need? What's going on right now? How has their pain points, their problems changed with the pandemic, with the season, with all of the factors um, that, that can influence buying decisions and their progression and, and what their needs are. So it's really important to be hyper aware of your audience and to be able to create, I mean, I create content, uh, right. For, for social media, which is, which is how I help our clients, um, and, and be responsive to what their wants and needs are and always be creating a, a business, uh, and content for them and not for you. Oh, yes. The amount of like, I'm just sitting here just like, yes, 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 yes. Because the amount of times I see, 
you know, I just see it all the time. People just constantly putting out content that they want to do or that they're comfortable with, that they think is funny, that they think is, you know, entertaining. And it's, and you can just see that, like that gap between maybe what they say in their Instagram bio and then what's actually coming out in the content. It's like, you're making content for yourself, not, not your potential clients. So um, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. And and I would say, I don't, uh, I don't think people are even aware that they're doing that. I think that it's, uh, and and there, there is a point where you want to make content for your clients and you want to define your business for your clients, but you also want to make sure it it aligns with you ethically too. So there are the, definitely that's part of, you know, creating a brand, for example, uh, you know, if they, uh, if, if they resonate, uh, with certain areas that you're not comfortable with, I tell my clients, if you, uh, for example, do not feel comfortable helping people with a, uh, animal-based diet and you're a vegan practitioner, um, you don't have to market to that type of person. So it's really, you do need to understand and create a market and create a business that, that is aligned with you ethically. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's aligned with your philosophy. That's really important. Um, but once you do that, you also have to be mindful of what people in that demographic want to see, not what you want to see. So I'm not saying you only create it for them. Don't care about you. There has to be a connect, um, but that connect is, is uh, can, it starts with you picking a market that you do relate with, or that, you know, has a problem that, that actually is a profitable, viable market. Um, and then within that, um, you're picking something that they want, but you're making sure that it aligns with you ethically. So we want alignment, but we also want profitability. Mm-hmm. And we also want to make sure if you're not solving a problem, you will not stay in business. So every day you have to ask yourself, how am I solving my audience's problems? How can I continue to solve their problems? Am I solving the big enough problem? Um, and those are the questions every entrepreneur, no matter if you're starting or growing or scaling, you need to be asking those questions every day. Mm, yeah, hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. Um, so we've kind of got, you know, our marketing down, we're feeling comfortable. We feel like we're connecting with our audience. We're, you know, talking about, you know, the, the problems that we can solve. We're doing our market research. We're doing well on the marketing side, which I think a lot of people can, can enjoy. And the marketing can be really fun. Social media can be really fun and we can build these, um, beautiful communities, especially around topics and areas that we're passionate about, right? Like if we love what we're doing and we're chatting about, we can create these amazing communities. But I think especially, you know, for a lot of service-based business owners, the idea of selling uh, a wall goes up. Like we can, we can do all the the marketing and have chats, have discussions and, you know, bring all this beautiful content to life. But the moment it comes to, we need to sell our services. Yeah. There's just these like blockages that start to come up. So do you have, I guess, any advice when it comes to maybe we'll start with the mindset side of selling on social, and then maybe we can get to some practical tips as well. Yeah. Well, well, you hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's mindset. Um, and so that, you know, for, for what I see and, and my experience, it's affirmations, it's building your confidence it's knowing that uh, what you offer and what you do as a, as a service or a product is helping transform lives um, and that you're helping your potential client by giving them, whether it's a product or a service, it's truly a service to them to give them that offer and that opportunity. So, so all of what I mentioned is a reframe of, of the mindset. Um, and again, this is part of developing an entrepreneurial mindset. As employees, uh, we, we don't have the same fear or if we're selling for someone else, it's not as personal as if we're selling mm-hmm. for ourselves. Again, if you're an employee, even if you're uh, you know, doing sales and employer doing some type of a sales role, it's not the same as if you're selling something that you've created or that you're a part of. And that's where that, that mindset comes in. So it's really shifting. Ultimately, the conversation is how do I shift to an entrepreneurial mindset? And every entrepreneur is a salesperson, Mm -hmm. every single entrepreneur. If you want to continue to survive as a business, you have to learn how to sell. Um, And how do you learn how to sell? You develop a mindset uh, that, you know, empowers you as a professional, as an entrepreneur, but also that's going to truly help the, the client on the other end. And that could be affirmations. It could be consistency that you're making efforts towards this, even if they're small, small steps. Uh, what I suggest in, in my, in my work is to st- set a lower price point and then progress with time so that you're not overwhelmed 
selling something high ticket off the bat, um, that, that can be really overwhelming for a newer entrepreneur or even an entrepreneur that, that has that's learning new skills. Maybe they're leveraging social media or they've created this offer, but they're also managing a nine to five. They've got a baby, a million things going on. You know, create a barrier to enter that's achievable for you and then increase that price as demand increases can be a really great tactical step to decrease the overwhelm. You don't have to do it all at once as long as you're making progress. Mm, I love that. And that's what I did as well. And so I can speak to that progression in price is something that, yeah. you know, you can build a really great relationship with sales because, you know, you just increase it as demand increases. You're like, okay, cool. Like I'm, I'm making sales, like I can do this, but I'm making maybe a little bit too many. So we just need to just bump it up a little. And, and it, it is, it's just, you can slowly work your way to a price and it always, you know, it always feels like you're pushing the bar and then you get comfortable and you just push it again. And it's a really nice transition to slowly build up your prices, I think, and, and your mindset too. Yes. Because they go, they, they grow in tandem. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that, um, I think it's, it's really beautiful when I see entrepreneurs who are able to break through and they're able to sell, whether it's higher ticket or they're able to get a lot more demand, uh, which is you know, part of the, the sales process. It's really wonderful to see that progression. And it's definitely possible. I, I think that what's important when it comes to sales is self-awareness. What part about sales is scary. And some of, some of us naturally actually have our, our inclined to, to do sales. I'm not yeah. going to say all of us, yeah. I don't have a percentage, um, but I think it's important to be self-aware of what part of building your business do you feel comfortable with and what part do you feel discomfort with and how can you sit there and work through that fear? And that's going to happen at all levels of entrepreneurship. But if that is sales, if the answer is sales, uh, it's, it's important to sit there and think through what specifically and why, and when you internalize and, and do that internal work, uh, it's going to help you be more self-aware, which is a big part of entrepreneurship is, is really that personal growth that translates into professional growth. And that's going to help you break through those, those scary, icky moments that feel super uncomfortable, but they are able, uh, you are able to break through absolutely with just some, some time and some patience. Mm. And you mentioned, um, you know, some mindset work like affirmations or visualization. Do you have any favorite affirmations that you like? Maybe you like to use back at the beginning or um, that you love to share? Yeah. So I'm showing you my wall here. I've got show your face and uh, self-made millionaire. Yes. So show your face is like a campaign I use on social media. And I tell people to use that hashtag and tag uh, dietitian boss, which is our company. And it might sound small. And you might think that's silly if you're listening, like, oh my gosh, why do I need to do that? Um, the reality is that people buy from, from people and they, and people connect with faces and, and the best way to stand out and differentiate, even if you don't choose to niche down or you're not very narrow in your niche is to actually show up because mm -hmm. nobody is you. And so the more you can show up, whether it's in a story, a selfie, I don't care if you have makeup, I don't care what you look like. I just want to see you. Right. And so the more that you can show up, whether it's a video, a selfie, you're posting something of you, whether it's a real short form video, carousel, still image, I don't care as long as, as, long as you can put yourself out there and I can make out what you look like from the image. Um, that's a step forward. And so showing your face helps you connect with people and do that market research, right? And grow that mindset so that you can start charging and increase your price point. It really all starts from showing your face. So I believe it so much that I made it somewhat of a tagline and a campaign on social. And then I tell dietitians every day to tag us so that they can build the courage. It's part of my framework as well um, to really connect with their audience and, and really help them grow as a person. And, and it's, it's really powerful. It's simple mm -hmm. and it's powerful. Mm, yeah, totally. It's like, yeah, you've built this little community, but in turn, you're like building their confidence as well, which, you know, overall eventually will help with your sales pipeline too. So it's all a nice little interconnected, um, I guess, hashtag you've got going on, which is cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Um, yeah. Are there any certain tips or tricks that you could perhaps give to the listeners to kind of help them, you know, sharpen that sales skill set or even just, I guess, even connect with it? I, I just think sometimes we like don't even, you know, really put the sales hat on. It's it's just something that we we feel nervous to do. So um, if there's any, you know, tips that you you could share, that would be greatly appreciated. 
Absolutely. So I will, uh, I'll give a tip about sales skills, although sales process is very important process, meaning the first question I would ask you if you're listening here is, uh, what do you have a sales, any kind of process? What does that look like for you? Meaning, uh, how do people buy from you? Do you enroll with sales calls? Do you have a purchase button? If you don't, are you directing people through calls of action? So it's important to think about what kind of process or lack of process do you have right now so that you can start at least using calls to action and telling people to reach out to you, to apply with you, to work with you, tell them that you're taking clients or that you have a product if you have a product and not a service. So it's really important that you are actually promoting yourself and letting people know that you're taking clients. That That's number one. I know that sounds obvious, but that's something a lot of us miss or we don't do regularly, right? So, so promotion is important. And then having some kind of a way that if someone can't, if you don't have a, a link set up, like a, a link with a scheduler or anything like that, that's okay if you don't yet, although that's ideal at some point, but making sure that you're clear with where people can connect with mm-hmm. you. If it is the DMs, PMs, whatever, just like letting people know regularly, like this is how we can connect on, on a further, on, um, on a further level. So that's a little bit of kind of a 101 um, tip about process. Um, a, a higher level tip would be uh, to make sure that you uh, definitely have a clear way and a process in mind of how you're able to talk to people and follow up with them. I'm a big fan of sales calls and I teach them. Um, so adding an inquiry, if you're not using sales calls and you're selling a service, it's definitely something that will help you gain your skills, improve your confidence, um, connect with your clients, conduct market research. And even if people don't buy, gives you the ability to connect more with people. So I'm a big fan, if you can't tell, of sales calls. I teach how to, how, how to sell on sales calls. It's, it's a very important skill, especially in, in the online space. So those would be the two sales process tips. If we're starting to get uh, to talk about my favorite topic, which is sales skills, uh, I would say my most simple tip, and I have so many, but if I were to pull one tip, it would be that uh, sales is listening and you have to listen about four times more than you speak. And the most important thing you can do when you're on the phone with somebody else's phone or video, I'm a fan of video, so I can hashtag show your face, right? Uh, if, If you're able to really hear what someone has to say and learn about their problems, people tell you all the time what their problems are, but if you're not aware and listening and absorbing it, uh, then you're, you're kind of doing a disservice. So the more you can practice those skills, what are they saying? How are they saying it? Can I ask a question to further understand and gather what their problems are? That's going to help you not only ultimately set yourself up for a sale, but ultimately like connect with people. And that's what business is about is identifying a problem and then learning how you can find a way to solve it. So there's a lot of significance in in learning how to listen and really practicing that. Mm. Back in the day, I used to be so nervous about selling and I'm a big fan of sales calls too. And I would jump on discovery calls and I'd just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And then, you know, as I learned more and learned from, you know, sales experts and stuff, they said, listen more. Like, why are you talking so much? Like, listen, listen to what they need. And then you can just come from literally, hey, you've got a problem and I've got the solution rather than you trying to justify everything, you know, rather than you just rambling for the sake of it, just like have confidence in what you do. Just like take a breath (laughs) and let them speak and let them feel heard and let them feel seen. And, And that I think really breaks the ice as well for sales. Has, has that been transformative for you in oh, your journey with sales? hundred percent, hundred percent. Like I laugh now, like, you know, when we're mm-hmm. talking about it now, thinking back to how I used to do those discovery calls, like, of course, people were absolutely terrified of me. I'm just jumping on and being like, blah, 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 for like 30 minutes. That's so intense for someone to take on, especially when they're curious about a service or an offering, you know, they want to feel like they can express themselves and ask the questions. That's why they book the call. And so we've almost got to like, you know, just take that, that responsibility to just like sit, be still and just listen. (laughs) Yeah. And and it's hard because we get excited and not to mention that a lot of people on the other end of that call, not only can they be nervous, depending on your market, but people have different personalities, mm-hmm. right? So we're gonna, when you're dealing with an introvert, it can be different than when you're talking to an extrovert. So being mindful of how people respond to you uh, is also something to keep in mind when it, when it comes to conversations. And so that's why it's even more important to listen and understand how is someone receiving you? 
Can you slow down your pacing? Uh, what is it that they need? And, and that skill, you can grow that skill when you're doing your market research and when you're talking to people regularly and when you're focusing on your people skills. I would argue that people skills are the most important skill to master. And the more that you can learn how to talk to people, how to listen and how to identify what their problems are, you will be 20 times further ahead than the next person mm. for sure. And, and it, and it feels good because then you can help more people. How cool is that? Yeah. That's probably the best bit is it feels good. And so you can repeat the cycle and you feel more confident repeating the cycle. Yeah. And so when you say cycle, I mean, you, you can develop a process around listening. And uh, as I mentioned, if you're looking for a tactical tip, because that feels too airy or, or loose, uh, just think four to one, how can I listen four times more than I'm speaking? So if you find yourself speaking more 50, 50 scale it back right? And really try to get to that four to one ratio where they're talking four times more than you and you're really absorbing and, and listening. And that's really going to transform the way that you do business. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for those tips. They are really, really helpful. And I think they're going to be very practical. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to, happy to share them. Um, time has absolutely flown. So I'm going to start to wrap it up, but I'd love to know what is next for you. What have you got in the works? Yeah. As far as, well, I, I have two things. So uh, my company dietitian boss has a lot of really fun stuff happening for, for our dietitian clients who are both new and who are growing their practice and their teams. And they're at a more advanced level of practice. I would say the newest, most exciting thing for me is that I'm growing my brand as Libby Rothschild, the uh, CEO of dietitian boss, creating an identity uh, as Libby Rothschild, the founder of dietitian boss, but also a sales and marketing expert and coach who can help people with branding, entrepreneurship, and, and sales, uh, which are my skills. So that's the most exciting thing that I didn't have the capacity to grow earlier on in my career because of focusing on growing dietitian boss. And I'm at a place now where I can start to grow my personal brand. And that feels really exciting for two reasons. Number one, um, I can give dietitian boss a, a, a bigger name because when I, ex, you know, increase my brand and my mm -hmm. reputation as a thought leader outside of dietitian boss, I will be sharing my story like I did on this podcast today. And so every chance I get to bring recognition back to dietitian boss and what I built and what my team supports is important as a marker of, of success and exposure. And then the other aspect is me being able to help more people, right. And me having my work grow and being able to help more people in business, whether they're just starting out, um, or whether they are already in business and they want to ramp up and they want to learn how to scale through creating a, a, a intellectual property. They want to learn how to grow a team or they want to learn how to brand themselves because they can't figure out how they stand out or they're, they're just struggling with sales. And so it's really exciting number one, to bring recognition to dietitian boss and number two, to be able to expand my reach because there are only about a hundred thousand dietitians in America, about 7,000, I believe in Australia and New Zealand combined. And so that does, it's great for dietitians. And, and I also want to be able to take what I've done and, and help more people too, outside of that, you know, about a hundred thousand people that are in, in my chosen niche. So, so that to me is, is really exciting. Oh. That is very exciting. Lots of good stuff yeah. happening in the works for you. Um, and if the listeners do like what they're hearing and would love to learn a little bit more about, you know, what we've spoken about, we covered a lot today. Um, where's the where's the best place for them to go or how could they get in contact with you? Yep, they can. Uh, you can check out LibbyRothschild.com and you can also find me at uh, Libby Rothschild on Instagram. Or you can check out my business Instagram at Dietitian Boss and send send a direct message and, and say hello or show your face and 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 uh, tag me for for accountability and and join join your ability to to show up. Mm, beautiful. And I have one more question to wrap this up. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? I would tell my younger self to surround myself with more people who are at a level where they have a mindset that is growth oriented and they want to look for bigger things. And I would put in more of an emphasis on community um, earlier on because mm -hmm. you are the average of, of, of the five people that you either spend time with or consume content of. And I, I would have, um, I would have done that differently. I would have been around business owners and entrepreneurs even earlier on. Uh, like I mentioned earlier in this episode, there's nothing more important than some supporting your community. And with social, you can find them pretty easily and just start engaging and use those people skills that will then translate to your sales acumen. Um, it's really powerful. Even if you're an introvert, it's still an opportunity for you to connect and just set your own boundaries and learn about yourself. Mm. Oh, couldn't agree more. 
Thank you, Libby. That was honestly like a wealth of knowledge in what, 50 minutes. Um, Yeah, so many good takeaways from today. And I just know the listeners are going to probably, you know, get out there and, and get their communities built and start shopping their sales skills. So thank you so much for your time today. That was, um, yeah, really impactful. Thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. I really, really enjoyed connecting.